Recording. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sacramento Sword School's Threads of Lecture Series. And our guest tonight is Ryan Neal. He has been a lifelong martial artist since his mother put him in Taekwondo and wrestling as a kid. And he's been like excited and interested in martial arts his whole life, studying a lot of different systems and uh, competing. Uh, and full contact martial arts. He started historical European martial arts in 2016, focusing on the Bolognese and the common school Iberian traditions. Uh, and he won a silver medal in the Open Long Sword uh, 2016 Southeast uh, Ren Renaissance Fencing Open and a bronze in uh, the Franco Belgian Rapier at the 2017 Renaissance Fencing Open. He's currently an instructor at Historical Swordwind Historical Swordsmanship in Charlotte, North Carolina, and is a rapier champion of the Barony of the Sacred Stone in the SCA. He runs a YouTube channel, and uh, the Vulgar Skill mm -hmm. uh, is the name of the channel, and he presents his interpretations of the work of Godinho. He has a blog uh, that's named the same thing. And in addition to Hima, he studies uh, various uh, different uh, Eastern martial arts, uh, as well as uh, looks like is that cat wrestling, catches, can wrestling. Yep. Yep. Okay. And he's just uh, after any bit of fighting information that he can get. Um, today, he's going to make our Destreza series eighty-seven percent more vulgar <laughs> by speaking about uh, Spanish common school, which is the older form, and sometimes referred to as uh, vulgar style. But even, even Carranza believed that um, there was such a thing as a wise vulgar, someone who did all the old style in the right way. And um, I can't wait to see what he's got to say about it. So I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, awesome. Um, first of all, thank you for having me, guys. Um, really excited to talk about this topic. Um, this is one that's been near and dear to my heart. I've been uh, interpreting with and competing with this system. Um, and with Godinho's prose, it can be sometimes very hard to interpret, um, especially because Tim Rivera was awesome and basically kept the words as close as he could without and uh, without really um, changing it enough that could affect interpretations because he really was interested in putting the translation out there and seeing uh, truly what people would come up with rather than sort of uh, poisoning the well with interpretations. So it's been a really fun journey to compete with and win with and lose with the system and uh learn these um learn these uh learn the system and really you know wrestle with its issues and um grow as a martial artist through it so let me go ahead and share the slide here So you're not okay. gonna blame Tim Rivera for Godinho's like tortured language? Yeah, I'm definitely not gonna blame Tim because I, I've been learning Spain. This has been my motivation to finally learn Spanish and Portuguese. And even though I'm still very basic in my Spanish and Portuguese, it's um, I could tell that this is not necessarily someone who's writing super clearly and well. <laughs> Um, but that's that's fencing master's disease. It's always like Morozzo, I'm a man of few words and can't write, and then he writes like the dungeon master's guide of Hema. <laughs> um, and I think it's always fencers who are always like, oh, I can't write, but I'm going to try to describe this anyway. So I'm going to be talking primarily about Domingo Godinho's work, but um, I'll also be talking about um, the common school in general. Um, I wish I could talk more about the other writers of the common school, but yeah, well, you'll see. So what is the common school? Um, it's the Iberian school which predates La Veradera de Estreza. Um, we usually think of, when we think of Spanish rapier and Spanish like more quotation marks side sword, even though side swords are rapiers, um, we, we're thinking of, you know, fancy lad math fencing. We're thinking of, you know, diagrams and first principles and philosophy, the right angle, that kind of fencing. Um, which is, you know, the, it's the 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 true the true school. It's it survives. It's the one that lasts not longer, but lasts more in recent memory and produces more surviving authors. Uh, we have names of 
the exponents of this school, Jaime Pons, uh, Francisco Roman, uh, Pedro de la Torre, um, but we don't have surviving examples of their work. Um, possibly their work did not survive, or um, they're, it's just undiscovered. It's sitting in a library somewhere, and grad students regularly pick over, over it because they're looking for something else. But that's, that's the continued goal of HEMA, is we always find weird stuff uh, now and again. So there's always hope we'll find these works. Um, Pacheco, um, in particular, um, Don Luis Pacheco de Narvaez um, discusses some of their work and their opinions. We also see um, Pallavicini, an Italian author. He clearly knew enough about De La Torre to be able to, and I believe Pons, to be able to at least quote what they said. So at least in the 1600s, it was still either quotable in fragments or may have survived. So there's there's hope. Um, the, the most complete surviving manuscript we really have of the vulgar tradition is uh, Domingo Godinho's work. And by manuscript, I mean manuscript. It is published and it's handwritten. Um, and outside of what he says about himself, uh, we have no information really on uh, Godinho. Um, so just going by what he says about himself, he's a master of fencing. He is from Santarém in modern-day Portugal, though at this time Spain and Portugal have a united monarchy. And he's possibly married uh, because in his marginalia and footnotes, he says that no unattached man should be examined to be a master. Um, so he says it's so it's possible that it was a requirement to be married to be a master in his time. Um, and he gives requirements for being a master in the main body of his text as well, such as he has good character. He doesn't turn his school into a house of cards or other unsavory things um, and those sorts of things. But uh, in his footnotes, he notes that um, bachelors should probably not be examined to be masters of fencing. His, his work uh, contains um, Sword Alone, Sword and Rotella, uh, Dagger, Sword and Cloak, uh, Sword and Buckler. Uh, but the section appears to be unfinished. There's a blank chapter and then nothing after it, the montante, uh, two swords, and a section he terms against treachery. Um, it's full of notes and marginalia. He frequently like makes notes in the margins or he makes like little end notes. And you could see when he writes his chapters that he crosses off topics as he covers them. So he's clearly, this is a, a draft for him. It's a, it's a very rough draft. And again, it did not survive or as a published manuscript. So it was probably never for publication or if it was we have no evidence of that um and some of the margin notes as tim rivera just said are in a different hand so it's it's interesting stuff um it's definitely enough to construct a system uh it's 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 a complete work it's not like you know it's not uh let's see like tall hopper where it's like this rudimentary picture book where you can kind of construct some fencing but it's it's touch and go there's clearly enough here to construct a system I have a question about this. Um, sure. So you indicate that this is manuscript. Do we have any uh, information about how the manuscript was discovered or where it was located? Um, I'm honestly not sure on that one. I've like maybe one to throw to Tim Rivera on that because I've that's something I've had trouble finding online and secondary sources about where we actually found this. Um, I'm not sure if we found it in the library. Okay, Eric should know. Says Tim Rivera. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably one that uh, that either Steve Hick or Matt Gallus uh, discovered. I'll uh, I'll see if I can find some more. That'd be great. Like, cause I I too I too want to know. Um, I th I think honestly the reason that we have this complete text is because it was not published. Because you know we have Pacheco, who is a very um a very axiomatic man who was one of the people instrumental in saying all the masters have to recertify basically in the new system. And given the inquisitorial bent of the Spanish fencing establishment at that time, I would not be surprised if some of this old stuff was just like, eh, it's an old book and you deliberately destroyed it or just it wound up lost for that reason. And it's possible the only reason that this manuscript survived. Now this is just purely speculative is because it was not published and therefore nobody could really get at it or knew about it. So Godinho opens up kind of by giving us three rules. When you're attacked on your right side by reverse or thrust, you defend it nails down. 
When attacked on the left side by your opponent by Tahu, by Tahu or Thrust, defend it nails up. So just a little bit of jargon. Taho is basically every forehand cut. This is a Taho, sort of descending diagonally. This is a Taho. This is Taho. It's how do we know whether it's a rising cut or a falling cut? It's contextual. Um, same with Reves is a backhand sort of cut. By nails down, he means like your fingernails are down. And that he says the quillins are perfectly horizontal. No more, no less. He specifically says no more, no less, and, and same with nails up. I, I bring this up because there's a lot of people who interpret this system. It's like, well, could Guardia di Alacorno, like from Bolognese, be kind of nailed? It's not nails down. He specifically says nails down, nails up. This is neither of those things. Um, and his third rule is don't defend only by parrying, but instead by thrusting. Um, I don't think some people interpret this as you should always be, you know, counter thrusting the attack. I think he really means don't defend only by Sometimes you got to make a crossing parry, and he tells you to do that. Um, and whatever level your opponent attacks at, you meet at the level of the attack. So if somebody thrusts to the face, you thrust at their face. If somebody thrusts to your thigh, you thrust at their thigh, and you meet it. You know, with with your true edge, the edge further from you, opposing the attack. If that works better to envision what's going on with this rule, that everything that comes from my inside to oppose with my true edge, I need to be nails up this side nails down. And those are the three rules he lays out. Does he break those rules kind of occasionally? Yeah. Um, every fencing system does. For example, he has, you could defend an attack to your leg, for example, by thrusting nails down and stabbing them in the thigh, but at the same time, he has an action where you remove the foot and stab them in the face, which is one of the most universal um, like fencing like universal fence encounter. If somebody attacks your leg, slip the leg, stab them in the face. It's basically been in every system ever. And, he's, and he too has this counter. Um, Tim Rivera excellently points out, um, and thank you, Tim, for being here. Uh, he points out that he says crossing parries are not as true. That doesn't mean never do them. He's just like, eh, it's not as true. Um, there's kind of shades of that too for any German school people in here. Denier does not say never parry. He says, if you parry often, you'll find little joy in your art. But if he, and he says, if parrying happens, do it this way. Like, if it happens to you. So every, every system, who, including Godinho, who gets you know on the high horse about countering his best, will still tell you, stuff happens, you should parry. One of the interesting things we find in Godinho is he has an unusually complete... Uh, complete description on sword drawing, um, including the surrounding circumstances and actually attacking off that draw. Um, very few systems that survive have descriptions of drawing. Some do, like Capoferro talks about it, and other people talk about um, Tebow talks about it, uh, and um, various other masters talk about like sort of the drawing motion. Um, Paladini, which has been my main reading, has lots of interesting draws that you do when you're in close range. But Godinho's is a very complete description. He describes it, you know, the circumstances where you are close to each other and are at the end of your words. Or <laughs> like so, like ta talking. Who, um, like you've, you're done talking now is fight time. And he talks about how you draw and you step back, um, and then like need more room, you take another step, and then you deliver a cut or a or thrust. Um, and then how to defend against that, which he says defense by the same edges. Um, by same edges basically means you attack, you defend the attack the way you were attacked. So if somebody gives you a nails up thrust, if you counter with your own nails up thrust to close the line and kill them, that is defense by the same edges. So he gives a little bit of a play. I actually run this as a kata for new students, um, very Kodiu like, who um, basically. You know, I have my students practice being both sides of that draw and just practicing drawing the sword quickly. Um, from we, we make our own scabbards out of Kydex, and if you don't have a scabbard, at least mime it at, and practice being able to draw and attack off the draw. I view this as extremely important, but I'll go into more detail about my training method for this system later. Fighting multiple opponents with a single sword. He's also unusually concerned with multiple opponents in our surviving, uh, threatening, or, or surviving fencing treatises. Um, a lot of our fencing treatises, as you know, including Godinho, are mainly focused on one-on-one. -on -one. 
because that's sort of the root of fencing, and I can't take somebody who's never fenced and be like, all right, lesson one, fight these three guys. But Godinho early on gives you advice on how to cut and how to cut against many and against one. And then basically you basically cut a wide cut till you get to the end of the end of the line, essentially, of people in front of you. And then you thrust back where you came. So you basically, not necessarily to kill anybody, but basically to close the line. And also when I thrust back here, now my hand is primed to give out a vase that goes across the line. And then I give a thrust back here. And now I can give my thought. And it's sort of stepping side to side, um, letting the foot kind of swing in front. Swing may not be the best term for it, but it's the foot kind of slides around from left to right, changing your lead as you cut down this line, making these wide cuts against multiple opponents. Um, and I think that honestly, that really gives us interesting context to what concerns Godinho, is, if not the common school as a whole. It's the fact that he's not super early on, he's telling you, oh, if you have multiple guys, you need to do this. And frequently throughout this treatise, he'll be like, oh, and if you have multiple opponents, you need to do this. And you see, you see a little of that in other systems, like you see in Manciolino, the bullies tradition. Like, if your partner has a cloak and you have a cloak, how to fight two guys with sword and cloak, and like this sort of two-on-two -two cloak tag match, or little bits and pieces of multiple opponent work. But Godinho, I think, covers it better than any author, and it's it shows what concerns him is less the one-on-one -on -one fighting or not less than one of them, in addition to the one-on-one -on -one fighting, uh, the ability to deal with multiple people. This is important to him. Enough to write it multiple times in a treatise how you do it. Um, also of interest is how you defend yourself in a fencing school. Uh, there's an order of operations to what, the, what you do. When it comes to taking off your sword, taking off your hat, taking off your cloak, you make sure you always have a weapon in your hand. Like, you don't give away the sword, or like, when you're done after the bout, he says if someone's still still ticked about it, you make sure you got your real sword before you set the practice one down. <laughs> um, later author, Tomas Luis, who is kind of this vulgar, he has this vulgar way about him too, he also has nails up, nails down, and a lot of kind of vulgar stuff, but I've not really been able to dive into where he fits in the pedagogy um, tradition. Uh, Tomas Luis gives examples that if somebody hits you on the head because you're wearing a broad-bimmed hat, you tighten your hat down so they don't get the satisfaction of seeing you bleed. So he, fencing schools in Iberia are extremely dangerous. Tomas Luis gives the same advice, like, hey, you hand your sharp to a trusted friend like only after you have the, the blunt in your hand. He, and someone said Iberian fencing schools are shady. Yeah, Tomas Luis warns that, like, beware of masters who stand on a certain side of their, their student because they're going to use their master staff to basically screw with your cuts and favor their student. These are being dangerous as hell. And Godinho is like explicitly telling you, hey, this is really dangerous, guys. So here's some advice about how to do it. Um, and I, I enforce this at my school, for example. Um, I, I have people begin the traditional way at, at their first um, partner drill where the swords begin on the ground, which is where they traditionally were. And then you have to get that and pick it up. And I always have people like, you You squat. You don't bend over. You squat. That way you're dynamic and ready to go, keeping your eyes on the opponent. Pick the sword up. And that way you're already in a martial mindset, a very Godinho mindset, like from the very first action you do. And I think that, that Godinho is trying to teach us this sort of, you know, very modern mindset of self-defense, that you need to be in this mindset ready to go at all times. You don't just get to be, like, relaxed and friendly just because this is a fencing bout. Um, here's some more highlights from the single sword. He has defense by the same edges, like I mentioned, which is named as Vulgar and Pacheco because what isn't. Um, he has ripping, which is sort of described as a lowering of the sword. And it basically is, it invites an attack to the high line. He lowers, and then when he gives the attack, I raise the sword in sort of a beat, and then I deliver a cut. Whether it's a rip to a reves or rip to a taho, it's basically the this is what ripping is, and it shows up a decent amount to sort of invite and then go. Godinho loves inviting. Um, this is a vulgar technique, um, the vulgar technique of invitation in Pacheco. Is that um, Yamar, Lamar in Spanish? Yes. Thank you, Johnny Sinawali. Um, he, uh, he has testing and gaining. 
Um, so testing is essentially using the sword, like at the very end, to sort of you know push on the opponent's sword a little, see what he does. Does he attack? Does he basically yield around? What does he do? And gaining, which is sort of a progression of testing, where I you know move in a little bit, not too much. He he, Godinho gives tells you you shouldn't really gain with the strong strong of your sword, just because of the fact that it makes it easy for him to free, to to basically come around and kill you, and then you're too far in. Um. So he uses the middle, and he gives the metaphor of it's like you know being a scout in enemy territory that you have to be very careful, and you sort of proceed from testing to gaining. And Pache and uh, Pacheco calls both these vulgar, and he actually says that I believe testing was invented by the Spanish. Um, and he's, what is the difference between gaining and atajo? Different first causes is what like many this. Like LVD practitioners will say, and that's that's true because it comes from an Aristotelian mindset. But it it functionally often works the same. That I use the middle of my blade and I close the line. I have now gained a sword with a stronger part of my sword. So he has a few bad options. He can let me stand there, and then I'm going to stab him in the face. He can choose to free below, and if he chooses to free or free above, like that gives me the time to stab him in the face. It, it's the same lose lose that's presented by Atajo. Um, balanza, um, which is basically, again, it's sort of an inviting technique. You lower and you lean the body back just a little. I tend to, depending on, like, you know, my opponent, I'll sometimes really exaggerate it, but I'll, I'll often sometimes lower subtly and just sort of lean back just a little. And that basically draws them high. Then as they go high, you s slip the body and then stab them in the gut. Um, it's a body evasion. Um, in one instance, he's... Um, he actually describes it that if you're doing this in play, if someone decides to be like a smart aleck and take an after blow on you, he gets parry for it. So every now and again, he gives you that advice about like, oh, by the way, if this is for play and someone's going to be like, you know, a wiseacre about um, <laughs> trying to take after blows on you, slip, but stab him in the gut. And I usually run by uh, because that's sort of implied there. And also, you're in a bad spot if his sword's like kind of weighed on you and you've stabbed him because you may not have killed him. Um, I, I, that's awesome, Tim, because I too have accidentally headbutted somebody doing this. <laughs> Head, headbutted them right in the gut. Um, uh, he has advice on, uh, and it's a Balanzada sort of analogous to um, Zambuida and what Pacheco sometimes calls against infidels, infertile, and Pacheco describes it offensively, which is the difference. If you just kind of, you know, offensively do this, it's horrible and bad. If you do it defensively, which is the way Godin describes it, it's suddenly very good. Which kind of goes into my theory that when Pacheco describes bad vulgar techniques, he's just describing bad fencing. He's not actually saying that, like, oh, everyone who does a technique like this is, you know, an idiot. Though I think in his tretas, he sometimes presents the fencer as an idiot because... If the opponent did the right thing, then your technique won't work because you'd, you'd be dead. Your, your job is to also punish people when they do the wrong thing. Um, he has defeating an opponent wearing... Um, thank you. Like I was, I was trying to do Yamar, but I'm like, does that change at the beginning of words? <laughs> so I always like screw up on, the, on that word, Yamar. Or Yamar. Um, defeating an opponent wearing hidden armor. Uh, he has advice for if somebody's wearing hidden armor, how to kill them. Um, the first step is stab them in the face because the hidden armor isn't there now, is it? Because he has, you know, <laughs> his face is there. Um, otherwise, he has you do it to the armpit, attack the uh, attack the legs. Um, one example he gives is the punching thrust, um, where he says if somebody is closing with you and is mistreating you, um, so I take that as basically he's trying to to grapple you. He says you withdraw the arm nails down. So the thrust gains air, and then you ram this thing, nails up as hard as you can into his chest. And he says, if you doubt the power of this, do it on a wall, and you'll see. Um, so basically, like, you know, this is one technique you really can't do on a partner, because it's ultimately, like, you don't jab people in SCA or HEMA fencing because it hurts. This will really hurt. But it's great to attack people in hidden armor. Um, you don't ever teach anyone brasal or to do it yourself, um, which is basically putting a hidden forearm armor on, like a wooden plank or hidden armor, and using it to parry. He says, 
No good master will teach anyone to do this or do it. He does not consent to the teaching of this technique at all. It is bad. And so he's like, specifically talking about hidden, something that's hidden in this case with the Brassal? Um, it seems to be, um, because that's just usually how I've seen it used, but it's like, and when he later talks about uh, cloak, he says, you parry with a sword and then you move it with cloak in the manner of Brassal. So he seems to be describing that technique that Pacheco describes as using like forearm armor, essentially. And he does have, you know, parries with the hand, but he doesn't, he says, do not try this technique. He just adv advocates against it, but it, th nothing specifically says it's hidden. He, he does parry hand, hand arm, but he doesn't do it for cuts. Figueredo has a section on Brestal, but it's not clear if it's just like the lower cannon of the arm or includes elbow or the full arm. Yeah. And like punching thrust, which is named as vulgar by Pacheco, which is again that sort of withdrawing and punching back. It shows up a lot in his two sword, but he also has it, like I said, in the single sword. And chapters for lefties. Um, many Iberian sources state that left handedness is a product of bad parenting or a defect, and they give advice on how to train it out explicitly. Like, for example, in um, uh, Viedma, I believe, has like the how to train a lefty to be right handed. And this is basically like, you know, uh, I think it's Roman who says, as quoted by Pacheco, who says, this defect never appears in the upper classes. Um, so, like, people just, like, hate lefties. Godinho gives rules for lefties. Not like, you know, we, we occasionally, in medieval sources and Renaissance sources, we see it treated at least neutrally. Like, Lichtenauer, for example, says, oh, hey, if you're left-handed, just cut from your strong side as your first cut. Don't cut backhanded. And then goes on to just talk about right-handed people. Or you have authors talking about how to fight left-handed people. But Godinho, he gives actual chapters of, like, being a lefty. And how to be a lefty. This is unbelievably rare, especially in medieval and Renaissance sources, how you as a left-hander, not you as a right-hander facing lefties, deal with that. Um, he also gives a thing, you hold the sword however feels natural, even in the left hand. Then he goes on how it's this whole philosophical sidebar about like, you know, it's really best to go with nature. And it's one of his few philosophical beats he goes on. And this kind of gives me my theory a little bit that, so oh, being you a lefty? Because he's like unusually charitable to left-handed among our fencing sources and like really goes out to defend left-handedness. And sometimes when I look at his manuscript, I'm like, that could be lefty smudge or it could just be bad handwriting. I don't know. Um, or is this just a continuation of his pragmatism that I'm just going to have left-handed students better teach him how to fight lefty good? But, you know, as a lefty myself, you know, I, 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 it, it's near and dear to my heart. Sword and shield. Um, Godinho talks about mismatched weapons um, in Sword and Shield. Like, what do you do if you fight a Montante, which is run. You, you withdraw if you can. <laughs> and how to fight other sorts of weapons. Um, this is very interesting to us because, again, we're not in a dueling context where we're assuming matched weapons. We're not in the context of a lot of our systems, which almost exclusively deal with matched pairs and very rarely deal with a mismatched weapons. Godinho talks about it in almost every the beginning of everything on on each of his weapons. It's like, here's how this weapon needs to fight this, 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 and this. And it's very interesting tactical advice. Um, the shield is kept close to the body as a sort of default position, one palm away. Um, this is sort of contrast to Capoferro and like the Bolognese, where you see this thing usually held out edge forward and presented towards the opponent. It's kept here, it's very conservative. And when you get your shield ready, he has you ready your cloak and everything else with it. So like you kick the cloak off and you don't ditch it. You you basically kind of ready it with the shield and he gives the sidebar you don't leave evidence behind you don't leave cloaks you don't leave scabbers you don't leave, leave any of that and um Tomas later in the vulgar school is like you don't leave cloaks you don't leave scabbers you don't leave hats you leave nothing <laughs> that people can like you know trace back to you um sword and shield is often referred to as queen of weapons um roman he calls sword and shield the best of all weapons um, Pacheco says that Roman's contradicting himself because he's like, hey, you just called Montante the eagle of weapons and Sword Alone is the queen of weapons. Um, I have the theory that Roman is just being medieval about it. And sort of what I mean by that is you look at Fiore, for example, the Italian master, Fiore dei Liberi, and he's 
you know, I am the sword. I can kick everything's ass. It's like, I am the spear. I'm the best weapon ever. It could beat all weapons. I'm the dagger and no weapons or armor can beat me. I think it's just a medieval hyping left poetic structure about like, yes, you can prevail. I don't think like, I think Pacheco is just reading this super literally about 200 years later. It'd be like, huh, that's self-contradictory. I'm an enlightened Renaissance man and just moving on. Um, Godinho, in fact, actually does refer to like the sword and shield as queen. Um, and he states that if you know shield, you don't need to train dagger and buckler because shield is queen. And basically masters try to treat these as different things because they can triple charge you. He says like that, you know, this is really just a scan. This is for the benefit of the masters, he says, more than it is of the students. That, But shield is, is the queen of weapons from Godinho's perspective. So we see again echoes that this co the common school seems to really favor the sword and shield pairing, at least in a few authors, as quoted. So this is possibly a reflection of just older attitudes towards the weapon because um, Tim Rivera is like very sly with like, and then proceeds to write 50 chapters on dagger. Uh, but the um, it, by Godinho's time in 1599, we still see, we kind of have seen the loss of the Rodalero, and like, you know, we see much more of a shift towards the Tercio model. So in, in his time, his sword and shield is probably starting to look really old fogey-ish. Um, but it's still interesting that the, the common school values sword and shield as basically the best of everything, you know, you can get. Um, and the shield, by the way, is usually played close, not just like, you know, close to the body, but when you parry, it's close to the head, you move it over, you'll even cross the body with the shield and take a different sided lead, and you'll cover your hands with the shield going low. Um, so basically, like, the, the shield is played very close. My sort of theory on this as to why is because he doesn't want a system that is just used for dueling. He wants something that I can also use in a battle fighting multiple people. And I can't fight multiple people when my shield is addressing one guy edge forward. I need to be ready to go. He also describes ripping play, where I basically, I keep the sword moving, you know, cutting at people, knocking weapons away, and the shield does not move. So I, the shield basically forms a wall close to me, and I can keep the sword moving at all times, just basically swashbuckling against five people. And this is sort of a different approach to sword and shield than you would see in, like, the Bolognese or Capofero or other authors. Sword and Buckler. Um, there's not a whole lot on this. Uh, it's incomplete. Six chapters, the sixth of which is blank. Hold the buckler extended. You seek the opponent's sword when they attack. Because he says if you wait for it, you'll be deceived and wounded because the buckler is too small. Shield, you can afford to, like, make, um, you can afford to, like, you know, just kind of hold it there. He's like, buckler, you gotta, you gotta meet it. Because otherwise you're just going to be deceived and wounded below in the arm. Um, and he says, otherwise you just play it like you play a shield. I, I don't know if he got bored or just left it unfinished, but he was like, eh, chapter six, rule six, there is no rule six, as Timothy put it. Two swords. Um, sorry, there's not really much more information on the sword and buckler. He didn't give me much to work with there. Uh, taught through the use of rules, which are kind of solo drills or exercises and principles that give the way you should fence or act in a particular situation or scenario. Um, they have names like surrounded in a wide street, guarding a lady, separating a fight. Um, this gives us interesting assumptions about the situation in which one would have two swords. Uh, because essentially, you know, we see in like Morozzo and the Bolognese that, you know, we're still one-on-one -on -one with two swords. We're still dueling or we pick two swords as our dueling arms or... Um, if we're like Altoni, it's just the thing, or um, even Paladini, this is just the thing you learn after single sword. But in all these cases, he's basically like, you're in a narrow street, you're guarding someone, you're separate, and he, all these situations involve fighting more than one person. Or like, you know, sometimes it can be like fighting one person, but he gives rules that, you know, these are how you move the swords and when you're surrounded. And here's how you separate a fight without killing anybody. And, um, the, I think that's just interesting contextually, the way he chooses to use, use the two swords as opposed to giving us lessons in one-on-one -on -one dueling. Even though he does give in the um, mismatched arm section of other weapons, it's like, okay, to fight a two swords guy, you need to... So he's clearly envisioning, you know, situations where you're using the two swords one-on-one, -on -one, but he doesn't write about them. He's just like, here's the rules. Um, and rules 
should not be adhered to is just gospel truth, like in the sense that I'm just doing the rule in a wide street. Like, you know, how can I, how can I, um, how can I fail? It, the rules should be able to be switched between as, as you go. Uh, he gives the example, like you're doing uh, four corners or four streets, and which, by the way, has a canonical jumping spin move. Um, so if you want to do a cool jumping two-sword spin move, Godinho is your boy. Um, and then he's like, once you're on one of the streets, you do another rule, and you, you fight your way down that. You're not supposed to just st stand in like the four quarters like you're a Jedi, just killing people left and right. You've got to adapt. Sword and Dagger implies, it employs a lot of use of invitation, uh, vulgar technique of Yamar, and, um, and then enchaining the opponent's weapon, which is the vulgar technique of Encadenada. Um, so you assume all sorts of interesting positions like dagger up, sword down, dagger over the arm, and basically you kind of invite, this isn't all the techniques, but he has a lot of enchaining, where essentially he gives the attack and I will trap it between the two weapons and kill him. Um, you see this technique in Kappa Pharaoh and a lot of other sources, but Godinho really emphasizes enchaining people. That you are inviting, he gives a thrust or attack, yep, you enchain him, you kill him. So you can't move. This is a very big emphasis of his sword and dagger material. Um, he has Can you describe a little bit more about what the uh, enchaining is? Um, certainly. So, um, it's hard to do without props, but... Um, one example like that is given in, um, I believe, Capo Ferro is if somebody cavaciones to the outside of my weapon, I just leave him outside, and then I parry with the dagger, and essentially I have now blocked his weapon between my dagger and sword, like a scissor. And I could either force the weapon down and stab him, or I just have him trapped between sword and dagger in a dynamic way, and that basically keeps the weapon locked and lets me kill him. Um, and I believe it's an action in Capo Ferro where basically you remain in um, Quarta on the other side of his sword and you just use the dagger. Or you can use the hand. I've seen um, Dave Koblenz use the hand for this where you entrap and, and go. Um, and it does make you feel like a golden god when you pull it off, as Tim says. It makes you feel so good every time you do it. Um, it can be hard at times, but it's, it's, it's a big part of his system. He gives mismatched weapons advice for the sword and dagger as well. Um, like he does for most of his weapon. Um, uh, John Golda is engaging P steel with both your blades? Yes. Um, it's basically you know, engaging it in a scissoring kind of action to truly block it. It's not this, like you see in a lot of systems. It is this. Um, so the mismatched weapons, if he has a uh, sword alone, you uh, parry with the sword and you rush him with the dagger. Um, if he has shield, buckler, cape, you parry with the sword, and you rush him with the dagger. If you have shield, buckler, or cape, you don't throw cuts, or he's going to parry with the sword, and then he's going to rush you with the dagger, and you will not be able to stop it. Um, I have beaten much better fencers than me in tournaments just by doing this. It is nasty, it is mean, it is vulgar, it is Godinho. Um, where, like, I have been, especially as a lefty, because my sword is usually, you know, on you know, sort of mirrored across from their sword side. And, like, I've got the dagger. Even in Sword and Dagger, where Goudini says, eh, don't do this with the, against the dagger, because, like, he's got one, too. There's just the element of surprise that they usually don't get against right. He's that I engage your sword, I take, I pass in, and I just start prison shanking you in the chest. And people have complained about it before, where it's like, oh, that's not really artful, it's not really in the system. Yeah, but you're dead. Um, the the Godinho system is like, I'm going to use the sword, and I'm going to offend you with the dagger. This is, um, this is a pretty much, like, uh, this is a really weird thing, because um, in the Bolognese, you have very, very few attacks with the dagger, for example. Um, in uh, Marcelli, he has one attack with the dagger, and then one where you throw it. But, like, that's, you know, he doesn't have... Uh, offense with the dagger is way less common. But Godinho specifically says, if you've got a weapon, a sword and dagger, he's got a non-offensive thing in that offhand, you just go in and you shank that man to death. Um, and I think that that... Uh, yeah. So I just want to comment. I, I have heard this... I've seen this before uh, in like, open fencing. and we, we In the past, called a dagger and dump truck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
that basically like you're gonna get dagger rush and you are going to die unless you are very conservative with these other weapons. <laughs> Do you see uh, any connection at all between that and uh, conclusion? I do, uh, in fact, that this, this idea, like, um, as a matter of fact, um, Godinho has a lot of things where, you know, he uh, uses what's called, like, a wheeling step, where you give a thrust, he gives a parry, then you make a wheeling step and cut him, but he doesn't describe what this hand is doing, and I find that those work well as conclusion, but likewise, you can take this into dagger um, as well, and the fact that, like, I have closed into measure safely behind your sword. Like you no longer have a threat to me, and this is basically like movement uh, movement of conclusion, but with a stabby knife. Um, so it's it's still it's still vulgar from like the perspective probably of um, Pacheco, but it is uh, it's effective, and it's it kind of takes the place of almost a conclusion, to, like the measure in which you would use a conclusion kind of goes in there because of just you know it's the same kind of situation where in um true school where if you give a thrust and he gives like a parry that's too big and you're close enough to him you could just now make a movement of conclusion same kind of thing because you're safely past the sword um additional dagger advice he tells you how to ready your cloak so you can also keep the da the dagger ready so you can fight sword cloak and dagger so if you combine this with his earlier advice on like how to um, ready the cloak with the, the shield and your other weapons, so you can fight shield, cloak, dagger, and uh, <laughs> and sword. So you can really, you know, but he's like, he's got lots of things about how you get that cloak ready so you can also keep using the dagger. Um, he also has advice on the, wearing the dagger. You put it on your sword side behind your back so that you won't cut your arms drawing bow for so your opponent can't cut your crossed arms. He says people tend to wear it on either side. He says so they, they feel like they're in an iron fortress. Um, but he says if you do that, your arms are going to get cut. He doesn't say by you or by your opponent, but either way, this draw can either cut yourself open or there's um, those of you who have done um, Japanese sword arts may know of various kata and where somebody goes for the draw and you just cut down on their forearm as they're trying to draw. So crossing your body is usually a dangerous thing. And the other example, he, the other reason he gives to why your dagger's back there, so your opponent can't see it. So you basically keep it like hidden, like behind your back. Um, and he says, he gives another example that people often try to wear it in front of their sword, um, especially if it's gilt and gold. So he says, like, if somebody's like, you know, if somebody's trying to show off the dagger, he's like, don't do that. Keep it hidden at the small of your back. I don't quite keep it small on my back, but I keep it usually kidney. So I can kind of cross draw. So I go both, can do both at the same time. Does he talk about the size of the dagger? He does not. Um, wish he did, but he does not actually describe the size of the dagger. I usually go from twelve to eighteen inches, which is sort of the standard we often see. But um, I'm certain you can go shorter. Um, for hiding. <clears throat> yeah, for hiding purposes. Montante. Um. Like, it's also taught through rules. Um, it gives an interesting anecdote that a lot of people try to do flourishes with this weapon instead of getting down to business, and therefore they get killed. Um, he gives an example that a guy's sword got broken fighting a montante, and the guy chose to flourish instead of finishing the deal, and then the guy killed him with a dagger. Um, he gives rules for guarding a woman, narrow streets, galley gangway, and other situations like how you're supposed to use the montante. Like in um, narrow streets and galley gang, or very narrow street and galley gangway, you don't throw cuts. Basically, you move it from one side, you stab. You keep it vertical, go to the other side, and you stab. Uh, for guarding a woman, which is a pretty common rule it seems in the Iberian tradition, because Figueroa also has guarding a woman. Um, you basically, you know, have them grab your grab your belt or your shoulders, and get their head lower than yours, and then you throw all cuts to the front. You don't go behind you because you might hit them, and you basically throw cuts in front of you, guarding them. The the sort of advantage of like keeping them behind you is you always know where your charge is. You don't have to always be keeping an eye on them because you know you can feel them behind you, and you don't have to um, worry about somebody coming between you and the charge. He doesn't explicitly say this. These are just advantages that just come to mind. Um, and when we've drilled this, um, that's basically the advantage, is you always know where the charge is. Um, one interesting thing to do, and um, I've done this with uh, a few of our fencers, especially um, Mary, because she's 
she loves to have fun with it. Have your charge be um, panicked and like a little less compliant about the drills and be like, eh, like occasionally pulling you and like panicking because that adds a whole new element of uh, I got to protect this charge, but they're a non combatant, so they have to, so they're not, you have to fight with sort of that restriction, and it's really fun to do. Um, he, and he gets, he does give flourishes to do, but he says that these um, these flourishes are for uh, for masters to do basically to show off. Um, it, he gives advice for how to fight another montante, which we see in a lot of sources. Don't cut, just just throw thrusts. The grass, he gives the same advice, like just just thrust the guy. Like do not try to cut with the montante because you'll die against another montante. He also gives a great advice: if you leave a door and fear enemies are waiting at it, put forth the montante point to one end of the door. To turn it to the other, going out in a continuous cutting motion. So if somebody's waiting for you, you just thrust the great sword out of one side of the door frame. Then as you step out, basically cut a big sweeping cut. So if anybody is trying to ambush you, now they're dead. Um, which again, people who write rules like this um, aren't really thinking of dueling, and they're probably not very nice people. And have seen a lot of stuff. Uh, so it gives us a lot of speculation about Godinho. In case you haven't been putting together like these weapons, that Godinho was not. Um, necessarily a uh, what we would term a, a pure gentleman. Um, sword and cloak. Um, he uh, he basically tells you parry with the sword and you hold with, hold it with the cloak. Um, do not parry cloaks with, like cuts with the cloak. Sometimes nothing happens. Um, other times Godinho's seen Arn mangled from doing this. Um, Roman, according to Pacheco, says the same thing. He's seen many people made crippled by pairing with the cloak as if it were made of iron. Um, so we see, again, very similar advice between Roman and, and Godinia, which kind of shows a continuity in the system. Do not parry with the cloak. Um, this actually contrasts with other authors, though. Morozzo and Delagoke do parry cuts with the cloak. Um, the way they do it is they step in and you meet on the straw. And like if you meet a cloak on the strong, those of you who have done pe like cutting tests and stuff before, it very rarely, if ever, gets through because you're meeting it on before it's developed on a weak part of the weapon to hit with, and it's you know thick thick fabric, so you'll probably be fine. Um, but Godinho is basically like, nah, sometimes nothing happens. He acknowledges sometimes nothing happens. Other times, you know, you're gonna get your arm taken off. So just parry with the sword and hold with the cloak. Don't don't chance it. Um, also, of note, he does not have throwing the cloak like you see in some systems. Against treachery. Um, Godinho's strategy against treachery is commit more treachery faster. Um, one example is you get a false apology. So you say, like, I swear on the cross of my fingers that I have no quarrel with you. Or you take your sword and you say, I swear on the cross of this sword, I have no quarrel with you. Then as you pretend to kiss the cross of the sword, you draw it and you take the pommel into their teeth. Or you take your fingers that you're promising and then you jab them in their eyes. Um, so you make a false promise on the cross and then you maim this dude. And you you draw your weapon and you get ready to make your fight. Um, he has things like if you're ready in your cloak, like you can whip the tip. Uh, which those of you who know who very heavy, um, that hurts. Uh, this is a very fun thing to practice. <laughs> um, not like you can't really whip things across people's eyes safely, but it's it's fun to like practice aiming it. Um, another example is you slap him as hard as you can. Then you put your hand on his hilt so he can't draw his sword. Then you draw your well hidden dagger and you knife him. So he has you like basically like slap, put your hand on his sword so he can't draw. Draw the knife and then you just you know go to town on this dude. Um, and also pocket sand. Um, he says, if perhaps by your own disgrace, you are surrounded by cloak-wielding gentlemen, which is a really specific scenario, which may, like, what did you see, Godinho, and or what did you do? Um, he uh, basically, like, you know, he says, reach in your pocket, and you, you move, and you start throwing sand in their eyes. The finest you can find, he says. So, like, you know, be sure to order really fine sand, guys. And he's like, ha, they thought that you, um, you know, he's like, oh, but what if you run out of sand? That's why you've got, and this is in the text, another pocket with sand so you go into the other pocket and you throw that sand you were you like you know your cup runneth over with sand it is like the ultimate anakin anti-anakin skywalker system well, like just chucking sand in people's eyes um another example that i don't have here is pulling the hat over the eyes, like 
belting someone across the face, putting your hand on the chest, and then like tripping him. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that pre-opens, like you know, any kind of drawing or weapons. They already you will you will fight like a rogue, and you will win because you have now like this guy can't draw his weapon, um, which is really fun scenarios because people who aren't used to doing these kind of drills, um, it's very fun to like work them because like they realize they don't have an answer in their system or their training to basically be like, what happens if I just, you, your sword is sheathed and I just put my hand on your hilt. Now you can't draw your weapon. Is your wrestling that good? Do you have a, are you quick thinking enough to go for your knife? Like, cause I'm already, you know, going for the dagger. So it's, um, here's some, you know, you've seen it, but like, what is most striking in Godinho's system? More emphasis on like, I hate the word street violence, but I'll just say street violence than most period system. Um, I'll say, like, what I mean by street violence is really like what more hoplologists and martial arts would call, like, antisocial violence. Like, we're not basically fighting a duel, or even we're not necessarily two guys, you know, who've already drawn swords and are basically going to throw cuts and thrust at each other in the street. Um, that we've mutually agreed and we know we're in a fight. This is for, like, you know, I'm escalating the fight first, or somebody else is escalating the fight first, or I'm fighting multiple people, I'm fighting mismatched weapons. We don't see that in a lot of systems. We see a little bit in uh, Mikhail Hunt, the uh, German author, where he's doing stuff like, you know, sword and pistol versus sword and dagger, or like throwing his rapier at a crowd and running. Um, but we don't see this a lot in period systems. And this is an interesting, you know, what does Godinho value in his system? Um, and Tomas Luis, like, you know, as well, he has things like, how do you fight in the dark? How do you train people to fight in the dark? And the example he gives is you blindfold people and you have them basically sweep with the sword. And the moment they find steel, they thrust along that because that's where they are. Um, so these kind of weird adapt, like he has a very, um, that kind of flows into, he has an adaptable and natural feel to how he describes stuff. You hold the sword however is comfortable. In his footnote, he, like the only advice we have on stance really in his system is in his footnotes is like, stand however allows you not to be struck. Which is, you know, it's not like, you know, other systems where like, it's two foot lengths or, you know, Tebow, it's like, well, we create this perfect man and like the perfect man, like for you is like his hand is this long and his thigh bone is this long. And, you know, he goes into detail, like about perfect length of like a lot of things that, I'd, you know, I don't necessarily bear on fencing, but this, um, this sort of very mathematical, precise definition can is like just stand, however, like that doesn't allow you to be hit. Um, this causes Godinho to come across as a survivor, in my opinion, a very adaptable fighter that if you catch him like in whatever, he's, you know, prepared to adapt as opposed to, oh, no, I can't put my feet two feet, like, you know, two foot lengths apart. You know, like, how do I how do I adapt to this? Um, which I think is good mindset training. So you've got a description of Godinho as a really practical fighter and. Based on what we see in the text, it seems like this person saw a whole lot of violence mm -hmm. uh, in his life. Um, it, what's the date on this book? Um, 1599. 1599. So um, this pre-Pacheco writing, and you say he's Portuguese, right? Correct. Do we, do we have any information about his background? Uh, not nothing that he's like other than what he said about himself in the book which is like i'm from santa Rem and i'm a master also he's like like virtually anybody in that area in the period he is catholic judging by like how he opens like with his invocation of his book but other than that we don't have anything about you know was a soldier or anything like that sadly but i think that would be super helpful if we can maybe dig through baptismal records or something at some point in santa Rem and see like if we can find a match of some kind Thank you. No problem. So why should we study Godinho? Well, it informs what good vulgar fencing looks like, because what we get from Pacheco is essentially, you know, somebody who does not like the system writing about the system, which, you know, I, I like, while I don't like Pacheco, I'm not going to call him dishonest on this. I just think he legitimately saw bad fencing and wanted to correct it. And I think that that's what many fencers like to do. Um, it also provides context on additional forms of violence beyond school play and dueling. Um, which is m like most of our systems are going to be playing in a school, which Goudin again gives advice about how to play in a school. He also says how you need to conduct fencing bouts. He says, hey, um, 
I already bad mouth Pacheco, I think, before you got here, Tim. Um, and it is uh, it, like it gives us um, additional forms of violence because Goodina talks about in school play, for example, you don't throw the same blow twice in a bout. And before you give a public bout, you need to be good and you be able to fence artfully and things like that. So he gives advice about school play and he gives advice about one on one, but he never talks about dueling. Um, he does talk about how masters only need to fight other masters in a visiting night. They don't need to fight students anymore. Um, and he, like, but this additional form of violence um, gives us additional context that's very interesting about how medieval people talked about martial arts because what we get is you see a lot of martial artists nowadays who talk about, like, you know, reality-based self-defense, which often is, you know, tactical LARPing, but it sometimes also gives, like, vital insights to, like, retention fights for weapons, or what if I'm attacked while sitting down, those kind of things. Um, this is the third point, but, you know, it's really the point of all our fencing. It is ridiculously fun. It is so fun to do this system. Um, it's the same re reason we do, like, every HEMA thing anymore, because usually most of us don't fight duels anymore. Um, it also encourages you to find answers in your own system, and it develops as a DS develop as a diestro. Um, though you will never be a diestro without understanding the balanzadas, according to Godinho. He says if, if anyone who calls himself a diestro and doesn't know how to do the balanzadas, he ain't a diestro. Which is kind of interesting. Because <laughs> it's very hard to pull balanzadas off, may be the case. Um, I'm going to give one example, because I like to give tactical examples I've seen. Um, like, fighting LVD is a vulgar. Some LVD practitioners treat the right angle as a suicide pact and not a tool. And what I mean is, like, they treat this sort of right angle position as a cargo cold of defense. That, like, I have the right angle of defense by threat, and therefore, you know. But this is really vulnerable to sort of the action of Garatusa, which is sort of, like, me gaining the sword, and then essentially spiraling and going low, which is, is that, is that Estreshar um, would be the, the, the true school rule that is like that, where you spiral and go low. Um, and then, Estreshar is one of them. And so spiral and go to the low line. And then people tend to suddenly really get, like panic and try to get that right angle because that's the happy place. And then you rip, you beat the sword up, and you end the fight because you're just going, you know, they're, they're making a violent movement, and you just make a violenter movement and take them where they're going anyway, and you cut them in the face because they were just kind of really focusing on, I got to get the right angle back. Um, and this, I sort of refer to it as over-rigid reliance on principle here, but I also refer to it as cargo cult of principle. It can make you basically kind of predictable, especially because we're still working on interpretation. And since we're working from books and we're still interpreting, our goal is to hew to the book and like really stick to the text because we don't have a living tradition. We can't like even Japanese koryu arts because they're a living tradition allow at the highest levels abilities to individually express and be less rigid in the art. But as we stand as hemus now, even as we grow, we tend to be very rigid people. We like can I? How much can I adapt? How much can I truly stray? Um, and what Pacheco frequently describes as vulgar is just bad fencing. You got to be aware of vulgar fencing done well. And so the way I teach this is LVD and vulgar destreza should be able to be done with a beer glass and a bar fight. You got to remember your principles and your first causes, not a cargo cult of the principles. And I think that like what vulgar fencing can teach people is the fact that like to be adaptable and natural while still having principles rather than like I'm safe because I have the right angle. I'm safe because I have a Tahoe. Like, are you really? Or, like, you know, do you lack the athleticism to just outspeed this guy, for example? If he could just be faster than you. Can you deal with that? And if you are really adhering to actual principles and first causes, you shouldn't be able to. But I think that this causes us to look less towards um, axioms and more towards adaptable and flowing fighting. One example, I, like, you know, one thing I like to talk about, um, like you know, uh, like one of the one of the best things about Puck, for example, is he's a, he's an adaptable LVD practitioner. Like you know, I had the pleasure of fencing him at Lord Baltimore's, and like I successfully hit um, uh, Bovair La Mano, um, which is basically like a thrust, and then when you parry, they arc around, and like you hit him. I hit him once. Then the next two times I tried it, didn't work that time. He mauled me the next two times. So he adapted, he, like, whooped me bad, like, for, punished me for trying. Um, and I think that's, that's, like, you know, one thing 
strategy puck is that you adapt quickly. Like, you know, it's like uh, the way you described it, I think, after we fence it is like you move like a diestro, then suddenly you do something off the wall. And like, so that's. Um, body and vulgar fencing. And it's one thing that I admire about your fencing is the ability to adapt. And I think that the vulgar skill, like, really helps with like, huh, that's a, you know, maybe I should be a little more natural in in some ways. And it's a way to, um, we're try, I'm trying to like, you know, convey a complex point here. It's the idea that if the Japanese idea of shuhari, that like you, you know, you emulate and then like you, you eventually down the road, like there is no form. And as historical martial artists, we will go with the lack because we don't have a living tradition and we always want to hew to the text. So I think that that's one thing that can um, for the vocal thinking about natural standing and holding the sword naturally and flowing as well as um, adhering to one's principles. I know that's kind of a long thing to talk about, but I like to talk about like an example from fighting that I see in each of my, um, when I'm talking to fencers, just because of like, it, I think it illustrates, um, it illustrates, you know, in practice, you know, it's like, hmm, maybe I do sometimes go to that position too easily. How do I deal with that situation? Do you feel like Godinho's advice about adaptability would be useful? So I feel like it's probably useful to anybody doing a sword art. Um, mm -hmm. But in some way, it seems like he's giving you permission uh, yes. to, to, to break the mold a little bit. I think so. Um, I think that this is like something that, you know, he's, that he, um, he really like goes into. And he talks about how, um, you see this like in uh, even Capo Fred, like practice is more useful than art in some ways that you, you know, just doing the thing. Um, and he, I think that he's basically kind of giving you permission that sometimes you got to break the rules. Um, and, or if you, you know, adhere to the rules, do them in like unorthodox ways to truly think about and engage with the system as opposed to a sort of cargo cult fencing where it's like, I do Zverkow and German fencing. Therefore, if he's doing an Oberhau, I'm going to win. Um, and if I didn't win, well, my Zverkow just needs to be harder as opposed to like, maybe just because this guy is a, this guy is a different weapon and things. I need to think about how to be crafty here. Um, I think that that's definitely, you know, him giving you permission to sort of do that Japanese process of like, you, you've learned the rules now and now you must find your own way and how to adapt. Um, so, so you think, and, um, I'm just I'm delving a little bit, but do you think that depth of knowledge in your style allows you to do that a little better? I think that's what you're arguing there. A hundred percent. Um, I think that you need to know know the rules to break the rules, and like it, it's the same with art and things like that, and like musicians, and that you need to know the rules, and then you can like you can play jazz, you can improvise, you can you can break the rules. So I think that you definitely need to know the principles, and then once you know the principles, you can like I said, you should be able to like you should be able to do even like true school with a glass. Like, you know, how do I take the right angle with this? How do I use the diameter with this? You know, how do I make movements of conclusion? How do I ataho? I think that those are that, you know, once you can do Destreza with this glass, that's when you're a diestro. That's when you understand the system that like what's really going on with the system. At least that's my take on it. People could think I'm old crazy Ryan with my crazy martial arts theories. Um, but that's that's kind of my take. Um, so, no problem. When I train people, I basically I give people standard fencing because one-on-one -on -one fencing is you know useful for tournaments for one, but also like you know it's the best way to learn is one-on-one. -on -one, you don't have to worry about twelve people. You don't have to worry about a weird situation. But I also give them lots of other drills to increase adaptability. I talked about the blindfolded night fighting drill from Thomas Luis. Um, I stole a drill from Garima Arnis, um, where you touch you fight on a bench, um, but it basically forces you to how to fight in narrow spaces and also like so if you're like jumpy like mixed sport fencer man who's like you know got the footwork of a god and can like you know leap 20 feet to the right like your longevity then leap back in and throw like a triple zverk thing um it forces you it's like well now you can only move in one plane how good you know how can you fight now and if you can't win in that scenario well no one will care how good you are in the other in the other situations you're you're dead um, like we could talk about how you were the greatest, you know, fencer in a circle that ever lived, but it's like, alas, his opponent fought him in a narrow alleyway and it turns out he wasn't very good. Um, 
and like I like to do a lot of um, scenario and uh, I told took this name from Charles Lin. If people know who Charles Lin is, at CKDF bro fight type drills, where essentially it's two people basically you know arguing and bumping chests, and I have a person behind each guy, and when the person like behind that guy raises their hand, that person escalates. So if I'm fighting this, you know, I'm arguing with this guy and staying close or shoving him, the person behind him raises his hand. That means I'm escalating, which means I'm going to draw a weapon or a knife or try to kill him. Um, so I think that those kind of drills are like scenarios where you guard a noble or you fight on a galley gangway neuro position or you like those kind of or fighting off the draw as well as with your weapons in hand like you you're both sheathed and now you both got to draw and get ready to go i think that those those different drills like i think i emphasize very heavily um in my training uh, which you don't see in other systems um just because of the fact that i think that that's what a true vulgar fencer needs to be able to do he needs to be able to adapt or he or she needs to be able to adapt at all times to um to varying scenarios uh like what draw i want to do when we start training is have um fencers sitting at a, sitting at across at this idea from reading Pal paladini where he basically has this drill like okay here's how you draw when you're at a table and one example he gives to at paladini that we can't really drill is um what well, we could but we'd be going through a lot of scabbards is you draw the sword partially, you slam the scabbard into the ground to break it, and then you stab them with the point because there's not enough room for you to draw. That kind of mindset in Paladini, I'm like, that's a vulgar mindset. He's thinking. <laughs> um, and so I like to have these different kinds of drills in addition to the regular standard fencing drills to build that adaptability. And uh, I'm ready for questions. And by the way, here's a here's an example of Godinho's writing and crossing out chapters. If anyone uh, questions. I've got a couple of questions that we picked up over the course of the uh, lecture here. So you'd mentioned that um, you had, were building custom scabbards for in-class draws. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, so frequently the easiest way to do this is um, Kydex, um, just sort of molding Kydex to the sword. Um, Eric Lowe, who is my teacher at Swordwind, um, I could have him like sort of uh, go to the detailed directions of it, but uh, the the issue with the, like keep in mind that the issue and scabbards and things like that is it have a tip on them, so do not go all out because we know untipped sword are not safe. Um, but nonetheless, we do practice our drawing, and that's like you know the risk we have to take when we practice the draw cut. So we're um yeah, you know, I recommend Kydex for like a cheap solution that's easy to do. And like something that you can wear it also if you fall on it is going to bend if it doesn't have a sword in it as opposed to like break or be rigid in some way. Um, that's the best way I found is like molding kydex. Uh, there's more elastic you can go with it, like fitting like sort of a slat scabbard, but that's that's usually what we do is the kydex method. Okay, and um, what about uh, choosing a sword for this mission? That's advice for. Um, I would not be a true vulgar if I didn't give the answer. It's like you could use any sword for this. Um, but uh, my favorite, my favorite sword for this is uh, usually a more side sword type uh, sword. Um, uh, reason being is like we don't have a lot of cup hilts or if any cup hilts really in fifteen ninety nine. Um, so I try to be a little more contemporaneous. I also like the the simpler style um, port and post just because uh, of a few reasons. Uh, one, there's a lot of stuff where you do the shield and you're covering your hand, so things that like get put a lot of distance between the hand and the shield can get a little weird uh, to protect your hand. It leaves too much of a gap, um, but the hilt is also protective. So it's kind of, but it's trying to fit it that usually makes it harder. Um, additionally, I find it easier to go nails down and nails up because I have wrists for like bad wrists, too much Maki Wara practice in my youth. So like I find it hard sometimes with more complex hilts, like my hand doesn't want to quite go enough. Um, and also, just as a military sidearm, you're more likely to see, like, port and post and, like, simpler hilts. Um, but that doesn't that is to say that you can't use this with a complex hilt that's perfectly period. It would have been a perfectly valid choice. I think that the choice of weapon, you should weigh out what, you know, a person in period would have weighed out. Like, how easy is this to wear? 
um, how easy is this to draw? Because like some people who are wearing more complex hilts, you'll see them like go for the complex hilt when I'm practicing drawing with them and they're just trying to find, like one of these is the finger ring without looking or to get like the hand, because if you look, obviously, you know, you take it eyes off me. Um, but being able to find the, the draw is much, much, much easier with um, a simpler hilt. So I tend to favor just like a port and post, like two rings, a uh, little sort of back of the hand ring, like a very simple side sword construction with a knuckle bow is usually best for the system. But I would not close my mind to a um, to other weapons. Uh, lengthwise, I tend to look like 34 to 35, usually because I find it easier to deliver very quick cuts that I sometimes have to do, um, especially because Godinho has actions that go from the wrist, where you remain nails up and nails down. And if you have a really long sword that's very cutty, this is not pleasant on your wrist. So I, um, I tend to favor something that's a little cutty, a little wider, but again, there's enough thrusting system that if you want to do like a 45, like 45 inch, like a 48 inch capoferro monstrosity you could do it just realize that you know cutting is going to be harder and drawing it is going to be really hard sure so um i watched some of your fencing at um the saint bartholomew's challenge and how how was your experience with that so some of that fighting um they were hitting pretty hard a lot of people were armored up um mm -hmm. did you feel like you did pretty well with this or, or what, what was your contact with that kind of uh, tournament like uh, um, using this tradition great like uh, they, like i think the system works great um uh, the, the big thing like especially with people who tend to make higher contact like in a hema context as opposed to an sca context where we're usually more armored and our calibrations just a, is a little higher um, and we also allow grappling depending on the tournament um the key is um being proactive i find is very effective so if um I don't like just go nails down and wait for their cut to like land and then like sort of parry and thrust at the same time. When that sword goes up, I stab them in the face and then like this catches the junk of what remains of their attack. So if you if you tend to wait for a really powerful attack, it's fully developed and you're like even at a high hemocodex, you're just going to get over physics. And also, you know, if you're just kind of waiting there, they could just choose to redirect to. to because of better mechanics. So um, I find that it works even at very high contact levels, especially at high contact levels, just because it's a, it's a system that I think favors aggression rather than just simply uh, waiting and chilling. Um, and uh, one, one thing that I think really helps in like a Hemacon level is be able to wrestle. Um, because like sometimes you will have a failed dagger attack. If you're like sword dagger, you come in, you miss, you got to be able to wrestle at least a little, to be able to, like, elbow over or, like, you know, um, so that that's my main experience. It's been successful. Um, my Marshall Challenge that I won at uh, FNY a couple years ago, I won with Godinho System. Um, I fought with Godinho System at Dragon Con at the demo bouts, and I found that, like, again, that aggressive pressing where I give that thrust and um, a lot of more conclusion-type actions where they tend to make a big parry, and I'll come around, make the wheeling step, and cut their face um pushing the pace even though it seems like aggression into aggression is you know going to get you hurt if you do aggression correctly it, it stops the attack before it begins it's sort of that aikido principle of orimi like I, they can't like you know if i enter like they can't develop the power enough and i can you know psychologically unbalance them as much as like you know physically unbalance them so we still Did I answer your question yeah yeah it does um we have a lot uh, more questions coming in, so I'll try to be less wordy. No, no. Uh, it, as long as it's interesting, and it has been uh, quite interesting. So I got a question about um, how much do you think uh, true school fencers actually stuck to their system uh, in a real fight outside a formal environment? You think everybody gets mm. a little bit vulgar when the rubber hits the road? I do. Um, I, I, I think that, I think this is because like, um, no matter like, you know, that I think in, in you know, I, I'm a Platonist, um, uh, by philosophy. So like, you know, this, but like everything is sort of a, a bit of an imperfect reflection of the good. And so, you know, we could talk all day about, um, that 
you know, this is the ideal of fencing, and that would be true, except for the fact that, you know, maybe I woke up, you know, I've only got four hours of sleep, so now I'm slow. And people who say athleticism doesn't matter in fencing are liars, or they're athletes. Um, if somebody is like, you know, a like gold medal, like Olympic FAist, and you give them a rapier, their chances are they're going to one light you, even if they have not fenced a lot of like classical rapier, just because they're a top level athlete that has been selected because they are a top level genetic god. Um, but so, how do you win against that? Well, you gotta you gotta be vulgar. Um, that like in, in the end, it's like well, you gotta be creative. You gotta think outside the box, and you 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 could always return to like you know that center, that happy place. But you have to be able to can't get the happy place. Better throw a knife at him, uh, kind kind of stuff. Uh, one example, I forget the author that um, Pacheco talks about. He actually says that one trick that one of the vulgar authors talks about is basically like throwing a rock or knife at somebody to distract them and then stabbing them. Um, the Koryu art I study, uh, um, Takamura Hashino Yoshinru, had like all the sword arms that I've seen so far katawaized open by throwing a shuriken, throwing like a, just a metal spike at that dude, because otherwise you're not going to be able to close and take a sword. You, it's already desperate enough. So I think that like everyone gets a little vulgar at times. Um, and Tim excellently did this in his lecture where he pointed out uh, Pacheco th says that like, um, Thrust by the same edges is not vulgar, basically, if you're fast enough. So I think that that's, that's, that's true, that, like, you know, if you have the attributes, not necessarily being faster or more athletic, but if um, you have that psychological moment where you can just take it vulgar for an instant and then go back to your ideal, which, you know, is your 90% of cases, I think that that's, that's definitely the best approach. I think that that's really what people did historically, is that they fenced a little vulgar and, you know, strived for the ultimate perfection but occasionally just had to do what had to be done right so still still more questions yeah still plenty more questions here so Godini's book is not particularly well organized can you, can you talk about maybe what difficulties you had in interpreting it um how you approached that maybe advice you have for other people who are trying to do the same thing and come up with their own interpretation of it like oh, how sure. you work from a difficult source uh, it's a very difficult source. Um, so uh, stay away from, um, I believe, chapter 21 or 20. Like, forget the number of it, um, Tim. But like, that is such a dense web of text. That is a chapter that is going to remain a mystery to me, possibly to my dying day, unless I have a magic mystery tour. Of like, oh, that's what he meant. That's that's the that's the that's the action. Um, like, Jason White has the theory that it's Tornada, which is a, a good theory, but. But barring that terrible chapter aside, um, so I think it's 21 Single Sword, yes. Um, but though Tim, like Brian, knows the one I'm talking about because I've asked about it. He's like, eh, I don't really have an interpretation I like. Uh, so what you need to do with Godinho, especially because it's not well organized, and again, there's times there's times even early on where he says, step with your left foot. And then like a sentence later, he's like, by your left foot, I mean your right foot. He like literally writes out his correction or like and like at the end of the book, after against treachery, he's like, more single sword. So, so it's it's not a well-organized source, and you will not... I, I currently am doing my videos chapter by chapter because I think a lot of people work through it that way. But the best way to approach this system is look at your three rules. And then what you need to make, like, a note, like, do is sort of... Um, make a glossary and what i mean by a glossary is not necessarily defining the word like okay he will define the word but also write like times he mentions it and what he has to say so when he sa says gating and he just describes loosely what gaining is as you're reading through the text if he says another little thing about gaining in another side chapter be like add that to your gaining notes it's like okay now he has this metaphor for gaining about like being you know scouting with testing like better add that one and so you have to organize you know first your glossary you have to know the system like what the system is talking about um a sort of concordance as john golden puts it and then like you you can start to put together the theory of fencing from his rules and um where he's mentioned stuff so you can like start looking like okay under his under gaining what are the times he talked about it and using it um and sort of what the project I'm doing right now is I'm putting together um, synoptic tables, like you would see, like in Parise or other later Italian masters of like master does this, student does this, 
that that kind of helps. But if you really want to get the system from the ground up, um, what other people are doing project wise, and I would be doing too, but I'm doing this other painful product project. Um, basically creating a chart of like, here's all the chapters that list this thing. Here's all the chapters that list this thing. And sort of, you could start building your fencing theory from, from there. Um, and I think that's sort of the main approach is know your terms, then systematize where those terms are talked about, and then start proceeding with the plays. And single sword, initially, single, you, know, you could approach basically chapter by chapter. Um, likewise with the Montante and the two swords, because the top rules, you could do almost chapter by chapter very early on, because single sword is just like, here's a thing, here's a thing, here's a thing. But you should still um, use a gloss, sort of build your own glossary. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Is there a theory that you've kind of pulled out as, I don't know, maybe like meta theory about this that he doesn't actually mention, that he doesn't talk about, but that if you are going to write your own book about good genius, um, system that you would put in so my meta theory that like you know this may be controversial to, to people especially because it gets a little close into the george silver debates that are once again raging across the internet um where like but what is the wrong <laughs> yeah where people are like you know uh, what does time of the hand mean does it mean if you move your hand first or does it mean like the time where it just takes your hand or a small step like side this this I got to thinking about this because of that horrible argument I'm trying to avoid. Um, I have my own opinions on that argument that I'm reading Silver and working out. But the um, Godinho, a lot of his actions where he talks about you start established. And what established like means, he talks about how like at extension, they have the, the tip is basically like a palm from their face. That's not very far. Like to be established, that's almost like a thrust and a small step. So like my meta theory is sort of like, the real fencing begins when you're closer than you think and you're able to do something quickly in a small step or like where you can test and then proceed to gain, like to get to that position. Um, fencing doesn't begin like in Missouri Larga, essentially, where I can like advance lunge or whatever. That doesn't seem to be like where his theory really, he does have ideas where if you approach, you deliver cuts and you rip and you keep the sword moving. But fencing really begins not at, um, at something kind of approaching a closer version of the diameter that like uh, what you do up until that point to establishing, especially because he talks about it and it's seems so close when he talks about like the definition of established that it's closer than you think. So that's sort of like, a, do you have the sense that, that he means like, I've told you several ways to get to this point, use whichever one is appropriate. And now that here's another thing to do once you're at this point. Yes. Um, I think I think that he's sort of, again, he opens with like this first, and it's a kind of a weird named play, because um, like his, uh, his initial, one of his earliest things is how the cuts are done against one. Before he goes to the how the cuts are done against many, and he says, you walk, you throw Tahoes and Revases. And then like, that that's how the cuts are done. And I'm like, really? That, just walk up to the guy and throw cuts? But if, for those of you who've done like Filipino martial arts, where you like move the weapon a lot, um, not all fields. Some are very static, but in, but like, you know, see some where you deceptively move the weapon. Or he gives the examples later of testing and gaining. He's like, and then he goes to this big corpus of established play, and it's like, this is where the magic happens. I've told you how to get here. Now this is where, this is where you seal the deal. And this is why most of my work is established play. And the, the sort of, this invokes for me, what this really invokes for me is, um, you look at the Bolognese, for example, the Bolognese, and you see, um, you know, a lot of plays, and it's like, here's straights of the half sword, which is, you know, now we're edge to edge. It's like, this is where the rubber meets the road. He's like, if you can't do this, you're not a master because you're just going to be able to back around. So I almost get this feeling that, like, straights of the half sword, or if you're a Lichten Hour guy, the bind, or, you know, that kind of measure, the Krieg, is where the magic happens for fencing masters. They don't care if you're 20 feet out or even advanced lunge out. Like, you know how to get there. Now that you're here, this is where the stuff happens. So that's sort of my theory on it. I don't know if that sounds weird, but that's sort of what I work with on that. Oh, that's really interesting. Can you, um, you, you've mentioned the Bolognese a number of times, um, some other systems. So I was going to ask you about invitations, where mm -hmm. he uses a lot of invitations. Do you see them as uh, similar to some other systems from Europe, either uh, you know, shortly before or contemporary to him? Sort of. Um, 
in one is so like well actually in, in, in more ways than people may be um maybe like uh may think because like a provocation that you kind of see in bolognese or like a delagoke for example it's like he gives you defenses that's one of the first things he gives you is like how to do defenses against these attacks he's basically what you sort of see in this bolognese idea is if somebody's just standing there like a mountain waiting for you don't attack him because he's just going to do a defense and kill you because his hand is much faster than you trying to approach and do anything like that and it's just too dangerous so what do you do you provoke you attack the hand you um, do a falso to the sword you do those kind of things so now he has to move he has to do something he has to counter he has to do so i think that's what invitations often do is like and the way they work similarly is like i can't test or gain this guy he's just not doing anything he's like standing there like a statue let's see if i can make a move and then, like, I could put the point up, or I could lower the point. Like, will I move now? And then he gives, you know, and make the make the treat like, you know, really inviting for him. Um, so I think that this is sort of like ties into, um, I guess, what the classical Italian school would call um, counter time of the sense, like, or um, something like that, where I invite or I I provoke a, a preconditioned response of some kind as well is a great time to invite. Um, where I know every time I lower the sword, he does this, and the next time I lower, I'm going to parry repost. Um, but that's that's sort of like what I see for his invitations. And if someone's not going to bite on those and just going to really stand there like a statue, you have really a few choices. One, if this is an actual sword fight, you can leave. It, like most of the time, it's just like if this guy's not going to move, why am I in this sword fight? I'm just going to walk away and just sort of back away defensively. Like he's he's not wanting to fight that bad, I guess. Um, the other options you have are good, good examples of how to thrust the hand, how to test, how to gain. And if somebody gains, like, at that point, he has to do something. Otherwise, he's going to die. But th that's sort of where I see the invitations. Plan. It's another way to make somebody move who's not going to move. Cool. Thanks. So we do have some more questions. Uh, okay. Uh, Fencer's trying to apply Destreza against uh, Italian fencing. So, um, I try not to be too overbroad with Italian fencing because like, even though Fabris, Giganti, Capofera get lumped together as one thing and they kind of can be fought as one thing, it still should be differentiated out enough. Um, but sort of my general approach to fighting Italian fencing is um, it sort of depends on how they hold the guard. If somebody holds a very extended, like sort of almost like a right angle, I like Garatusa, or it's like sort of that spiraling down. And again, people tend to want to regain their happy place. People don't like to be where they're not comfortable. They don't like to just wait there and wait and see what you're going to do. They want to usually regain a guard because clearly you're doing something, especially if you you really sell it. Um, and then when they return to that extended position, you rip, you make a beat up. Um, and again, it's sort of almost like a hanging parry is a decent way to describe it. That's done as a beat. Uh, if you try to do a normal beat, it's easy to cavazione if like they have the tempo advantage. If you do this, now you've got this something that runs perpendicular to the sword. It's harder to cavazione that. So if, as they're getting to their happy place, now they've made the tempo for you. You beat the sword, you cut them open. If um, somebody is um, fighting in a more withdrawn guard as opposed to like, so if they're fighting like, you know, as opposed to like Quarta or Secunda out here, they're fighting, you know, more like Terza Quarta or um, Terza Secunda, um, you proceed as as um as sort of normal you will will test the so, sword to see what they I'm gonna do. interrupt for just a second why don't you stop sharing your desktop because i can see that you're gesturing oh sorry it might be helpful if we could see you on the bigger screen sorry about that da, 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 stop sharing my bad um so like if somebody's like more you know more it's supposed to being out here where their extended sword where you gain you you got a two sorry you gain in some way and then they try to go back to the happy place you rip you cut them open um they fight more drawn like sort of the secunda tears a quarta and like entered on guard trying to gain you um the i recommend testing at that point like usually testing the point and see what they do uh, that's the point of testing it's like I give you a little pressure with the sword. Are you jumpy? Are you like Perry's McGee, where like as soon as you feel pressure, you you gotta go? Um, in that case, I'm going to free. To like freeing is just what Gudinia terms basically. It's sort of like a cavazione. You can free below. You could also do a cut over kind of freeing. He says and cut them open. But that's sort of the the goal at that point is test them, figure it out. 
Do they consent to the test? Do they just kind of wait? Gain. What do they do then? Do they cavazione then? Are they like cavazione? Are they jumpy? Or are they going to stand there like a rock? Are they going to, yeah? What What are they going to do? And then once you provoke their preconditioned responses, you you give them what they want. Um, it so if I know this guy likes to parry, like I'm going to give him a super parryable attack. I'm going to thrust nails up to the eyes, which is one of Godinho's favorite attacks, stab them in the face. And because I know he's a parrier, he's going to parry, I'm going to free, I'm going to cut his face open. If he if he's just chooses to be gained, I stab him. If he's a counterattacker, like he wants to counterattack all the time, um, I'm going to essentially act in counter time, to use a more modern term. I'm going to provoke that counterattack, I'm going to make a crossing parry, or I'm going to defend by the same edges. So it's the same kind of theory to fight the Italian style, in my opinion. Fighting is a vulgar fencer. Thanks for uh, answering that. And also, whoa, you've got some classical fencing theory in there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I I learned it mostly at Rapier and Saber <laughs> like Pedagogy <laughs> Retreat, <laughs> which I fully endorse as, as a thing. <laughs> Was not looking for the plug. But, yeah. Um, you know, good. we never turn it down. Um, yeah, okay. So in your opinion, um, should a vulgar fencer reach into uh, true school? And uh, I'm going to also flip that around. Do you think it would be useful for a a true school fencer to learn the, the common schools? Um, I think a vulgar fencer should um, dip into every school. And like what I, what I mean by this is um, I don't have time to practice all the systems in the world which I did because I love martial arts, but you should have at least read the book. Uh, so like, you know, this is why I could pull things from like, well, you know, Gifsley Arrow said, and like, you should at least have read the book. You should be able to say like, you know, well, Angelo said this and th things like that, and at least be able to understand enough of like at least the base theory of what somebody could come at you with, because then that just broadens your adaptability. That's like, oh, this guy fights later Highland Regimental Broadsword, so I know he likes to parry, and he's going to slip the lead leg almost every time. In some systems, he's going to slip the lead leg every time he parries, so I can't like you know one two to the leg because the leg's not going to be there. So in in my opinion, like the vulgar should like understand every system because it's like you know you should you should you should know all your local gangs if you're going out like at how everybody fights, um, if you're going to be like you know a true rogue. Um, but specifically reaching into LVD, I think is good because you know we're we're post Carranza with um, Godinho, so there's people already starting to kind of pick this up. It's not like the the post Pacheco explosions or like this Cambrian explosion of fencing. Um, and authors and people arguing about like whether like Carranza or Pacheco is the one true way, um, but it's still a contemporary system, and you should be able to uh, answer it. And I think that another thing too is think about the way your system would deal with stuff. I think it is very easy to because we usually fight friends who fight the same style as us to basically fall into the pattern of well, I only you know fight people like me. You need to be able to fight the oddball stuff and see like where the other stuff is. So absolutely, you should be able to reach into LVD. You should be able to reach into everywhere. And also, if you could just pull a nasty trick out of somewhere, it's fun. It's it's very vulgar of you. Um, the other way for LVD reaching the vulgar school, um, yes, uh, partially because a lot of our LVD teachers, like Viedma and Figueredo, seem to be still pretty vulgar, even though like they're converted. A lot of them talk about things in a very vulgar way. And Tim's lecture, uh, I think Tim's lecture was recorded. Watch that and talk about like, these guys are more vulgar than we think they are, uh, especially Figueiredo and Viedma. Um, was Viedma Portuguese? I forget. Um, he, like Figueiredo, I know, I know, it was Portuguese. Um, but like, I don't think like, so. Hmm? If you look at uh, Tomas Luis, who's also Portuguese and also kind of true school, trying to not, there's something in the water, especially in like, in in Portugal, but like Vietma apparently is Spanish, that like they're they're dipping anyway into the vulgar school. Um, I think the vulgar school maybe hangs on in Portugal longer or just vulgar theory. It's like, well, I like this true school and I'm a convert, but sometimes you really got to go nails up. Um, even Pacheco, where he's like, sometimes you participate in nails up just a little when you make a Tahoe and things like that. I'm like, so I think it's it's it helps you understand your theory more and where people are coming from, especially when they're like Pacheco describes an action, at like the vulgar tretas, like okay, here's how you counter this vulgar treta. It's like, did, did the vulgars really say that, or is this just a bad way of doing the vulgar thing? But if you do it the right way, it's true. 
I think that that's that's beneficial for going the other way to, from LVD to a uh, vulgar scale. So we've got more questions here. I'm going to change this question to slightly be a little more provocative to create controversy and trap you into a position you wouldn't otherwise take. Ooh. <laughs> All right. So the original question was, would Carranza say that you could build off of vulgar fencing, but filter it through sound mathematical principles, which I think is somewhat what we had missed trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a hypothetical question on Carranza's opinion. But here's mm -hmm. the here's the gotcha one that'll get you in trouble. Do you think that authors, true school authors like Carranza and Pacheco took the common school and sort of filtered it like coffee through your theoretical model and it dropped out the bottom, uh, sort of washed up a little bit? So is it just derivative? Hmm. Not just not because that does not make it bad though. In the same way that like you know, Kyokushin karate is not bad karate. Like I do Kyokushin, but it's sort of filtered like filtered down goju to show to kind of a specific bare knuckle context. Um, what I sort of mean by that is like the good fencing in many ways is good fencing. Like it, it just is. We can you know talk about good fencing you know, in, in various kinds, um, but ultimately time and physics are, are just universal things on the fencing level. And until someone develops quantum fencing, then all bets are off. It, it, um, but it's, if you basically take the vulgar skill, it, the vulgar like destreza, and then you're essentially um, talk about like, well, let's proceed from the first principle. And this is sort of a universal principle in fencing. This is the farthest my sword can ever reach from me, unless I throw it. If I go up a little, it loses reach. If I go down a little, it loses reach. But let's start from this theory. So why would I ever want to, you know, have less than maximal reach? And Godinho, you know, has, like, the arm bent for nails down, for example. Um, probably because, you know, putting your arm out, especially if you can get stabbed in the hand, is not necessarily a great idea. You also lose some strength a little bit. Um... And sort of George Silver's quip about Spanish fencing, it's like, yeah, you know, it's the perfect guard as long as you can hold it. Um, and this is not comfortable. But if you take your axioms and your theory and you just take Aris an Aristotelian hammer to the vulgar school, I think it winds up looking a lot like um, La Veredera de Cereza, uh, just because of, you know, if you take those axioms and then, you know, Break them down. I think like what they wind up losing is some of the adaptability because you know again you're you're taking you you sometimes risk wagging the dog. It's like why does this work the best? The like you know it works the best because of math and physics. And it's like, but human bodies are weird. Like you know I can only hold. He does this weird thing. Like and you you see this even in Dorada, um where you have like the Spanish beauty stance because it's like what if his sword's really down there though? How do I how do I make a Tahoe? <laughs> um, so I, th I think that, that that is a viable theory. That's something I would kind of hold that it's sort of a distillation of the earlier school. I don't think that Carranza truly came up with this whole cloth out of like sort of like like this, he, he glimpsed the good and he exited the Plato's cave of fencing and like saw beyond these shadows. Even though it's, it's portrayed that way, um, I don't think that's really the case. I think that the, there's always reaching back into that vulgar past for something. All right, that's good. Um, so we're, we're well, was it a crazy was it a crazy position, Buck? No, not really. Um, you know, it's it's hard to say. I think that there are probably some key differences. Uh, like I think right angle is probably a, a point of difference. Yeah. Um, and the hand positions are different. Yeah, and I, but I argue that those are like distillations of like you know nails up and nails down. Well, we like nails in because it's the medium between those two. So ultimately, it's sort of like I have to have something to argue against. I can't truly come up with this from true from whole cloth. So I think it, that's kind of my take on it. But I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, well, it's clear he's aware. Like when Karanz is writing about it, he's aware of the other schools. Mm -hmm. um, so we are uh, eight minutes, nine minutes now past the hour. Uh, when we would normally start to wrap up. I want to like find out if we have more questions for our speaker. If anyone has any more questions, I can be here as long as, like, you know, Puck and Eric desire. Like, I, I really love talking about this stuff. I have a question. 
Um, you said you suspect that he's a lefty in a right-handed world. Do you think this might have anything to do with him liking two swords? I think so. Um, so, like, I I think that like um, if you look at uh, I think it's the Anonimo Bolognese, for example, and Paladini both. It's like you gotta train your left hand too because you don't know what's gonna happen to your right hand. You need to be able to use it. Plus two swords, and I think that like it's traditionally acknowledged, and, it, and I find this the case and practically in my case as well that left-handed people struggle far less with two swords than right-handed people as a general rule like th i think that's because like you know lefties live in a right-handed world we're forced to use our right hand much more than righties are forced to use their left hand just because things are built that way and i think that you're it tends to develop more of like an ambidextrous brain so i think that that's why he likes that's part of why he likes two swords is the fact that he is a lefty and therefore it tends to come easier at least in my teaching pedagogical experience to left-handed people and in my personal voyage with two swords. Cool, well, thanks. Did he say anything about why he wanted to write the, the manuscript? Like, I've learned this all my life and I want to pass it on, or there's so much bad fencing out there, I've got to teach people, or? Um, not really that I recall um, off the top of my head. Um, he does describe things that he considers like bad now and again. For example, like he talks about how like, masters should not turn their places into houses of cards or dens of iniquity, or like he, various other things. He's he's critical of um, about the pocket sand is fine. Yeah. Also, it's uh, fine. Yeah, like so, I, but he doesn't seem to um, really have set out with a particular mission that he wrote down um in, in in his text at least so it's unclear why he wrote it we have a question about lowering the sword um does that mean um let's take two extremes and then maybe we'll find an answer in the middle or maybe you like one of the extremes um mm -hmm. lowering the sword does that mean lowering the tip or does that mean lowering the entire sword um i usually lower the tip because like lowering the sword um like you can you could do a little well, it sort of depends on the action, but um, I also sometimes lower the full sword, um, especially because if I one of his defenses is ag against an, a, an attack to the hand, um, is to lower the sword and go nails down. Which, if you just it, just moving the tip, like sometimes creates a weaker parry, um, like you're kind of doing like a a um, secund uh, kind of action. But if it's against a low attack with uh, usually heavier swords as opposed to like a foil, it sometimes creates a bit of like a weaker parry. Um, so usually I, I will sometimes lower the weapon as a unit, like from the forearm, um, but it could could be both. Uh, would I lower the sword for like uh, in, uh, to invite? Um, it depends on it, it's do what kind of reaction am I getting? Is he like the kind of like you know skilled fencer that like if I just give him a little bit of the line he's gonna go, or is it gonna be a beginner where I practically have to like just set the sword on the ground essentially almost to get him to come in? Uh, because he won't read the cue. So I think it could, it could be um, both, depending on the technique. Um, in terms of uh, Yamar, I, I prefer like to usually like lower the sword, of, sword as a unit, because if I just lower the tip, sometimes people don't bite. And I think that like it's it's better to just like lower the arm kind of from the elbow. Um, obviously, if you're like super in measure and you lower the arm from the elbow too much, and I think this is also, by the way, why Balanzada, he has you lean back before you do that. Is because this is a, a big tempo in Italian terms compared to lowering the point. So if you're just kind of staying normal and you lower, he's just going to stab. But if you kind of lean back a little, you get that little extra time, and plus it starts your, your slip, which I do kind of as a boxing slip, like with the knees and like under. So I think that it depends on, you know, what, what gets them to bite is like the answer to that. So without guidance on the stance, and I'm not sure there's a whole lot of guidance on the footwork, um, what's the frog DNA that you're using for your footwork? Because you mentioned boxing footwork right there. Mm -hmm. um, what are the different sources that you're pulling in for it? So like, you know, the advice he at least gives on footwork is he says like you do a natural walk is one of the kinds of footwork he has. So he has a natural walk, he has a jump, he has a wheeling step, which can be done kind of as a spring. And he has, you know, just keeping the foot in front and making small steps. So, you know, with a natural, like, walking pace, I think this is not conducive to being, like, really you know, deep and low and, like, back weight 
like you see like some Italian rapier or a Highland broadsword. I think this is so sort of the frog DNA I pull from there is um, a lot from um, Garimat Arnis, which is sort of you know where Tim, like you know Tim has the same system where I basically you know I will be square. Oh, this kind of ties into a question I see it's this square profile doesn't say, um, but I will be. I usually tend to fight more square. Um, this is because it. Well, like, you know, my reach is a bit shortened. It also usually means that, like, he can't reach me as well. And then when I attack, I'll sometimes profile to increase my reach. But then, like, I'll come back here if he's profiled so that now he can't quite reach me. So that's sort of the frog DNA I pull it as, like, versus square to profiled. And I tend to fight in, like, a, a, a natural, like, athletic stance and sort of, like, feet that are square. So my, my, my footwork winds up looking a lot like... Um, a lot like karate is actually in many ways like like fighting karate not like the sport karate but like full contact where i'm kind of square so i can deploy all the weapons i need that i can be square as i want and i'm like sort of a natural walking pace with my feet apart so that i can naturally walk if i have to without having to change my weight to either side um, so that i can make but so that's sort of what influences my footwork and the frog dna i pull for that All right, any other questions before we close out for the evening? I did find out uh, about where we got uh, Godinho from. Well, I can uh, report briefly on that. So, um, Sosa Viterbo um, had it in his book. He had a, a listing um, about him. His book's from 1899. Hmm. And, um, and he says where, where it was held in the uh, National Library of Lisbon. And so uh, Matt Gallus and Steve Hick came across Sosa Viterbo at about the same time. Um, well, about the same time that, that we got um, Figueroa's Memorial, right? Because that's in there too. So that was about 2004, 2005. So then we were just waiting through the early days to to um, be taken seriously enough to to get a copy of it from the library or from the, yeah, from the National Library. Fascinating. Yeah, it's really amazing to me that these books that were never published, um, they have this long journey uh, to us. And only in this last 15 years are these books available so that we can train from them. I saw, I see a thing too. Go ahead. I was going to say, and, and you know, Matt Gallus is a, was a lawyer, right? And, in Europe, and he was traveling all over Europe all the time, and so he could make regular visits to places, you know, like every several weeks or something like that, in a suit and tie, right, with a, mm -hmm. a title, and he speaks several languages. So, uh, you know, like if, if some of the others of us went to the library, we might not have gotten the same reception that he did. Yeah, um, I, I saw a thing talking about like sort of the profiling behind the counter thrust. Uh, sometimes Goodyear does like really profile. He says, make yourself behind the sword as much as possible when you counter. And that, I just do that as a profile. I don't do it like so if it's as a full incortata where I cross the feet because um, I think that's a different bit of footwork. You can do it that way, but it's just that's another example of Goodyear profiling. Just you know. um, speaking like to of like the manuscripts making their journey. Like this is the part at seminars where I usually get teary eyed, but I'm thankfully like not too emotional today. Um, I think, I thank, like, Godinho so much, like, wherever he may be for making this manuscript, and I'm just so happy that it survived to this day, that, like, this system, like, that, you know, somebody went out and he wrote this book, and, like, he never knew, like, what whatever came of it, like, you know, he, and it was never published, who knows if he died or what happened to him. But, like, it has made it to us, and, like, this is where, you know, some people wonder, like, why do you take Goudini so seriously, and, like, you know, in addition to having fun with it, but, like, why do you, like, love the system? It's, like, this, the fact that this manuscript survived to us, and, like, this guy's, like, thoughts, and, he, you know, they made it to, like, probably more people than he ever thought they did, like, that they ever would. And, like, Godinho, like, get emotional, but, like, I really hope that, like, he is, you know, he would be proud of my fencing and, like, the way I express his system, and, like, I really... Like, you know, I'm so happy that this system exists, that this book was found, that it was translated by the people who translated it. And, um, like, that, by the way, like, bibliography wise, I recommend Tim Rivera's translation, like, with Eric Myers and 
everybody. It's so good. Um, and I'm happy you made it. Uh, if you want, like, Spanish edition, like, it, the Agia Editora has it. And um, they also have Tomas Luis in an interlinear, or not interlinear, but uh, side by side, Spanish, uh, English. Um, and, like, Tim Rivera, like, being a smart, because it's the only one. Like, yes, Tim, but I'm really happy that it exists. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I try not to get too emotional, but I'm just glad this book like made it to us. And I truly love this system. And I hope you guys have liked me talking about it because I, I'm really passionate about it. And I definitely want to continue to grow, win with it, spread it until like the East Coast becomes the vulgar coast. And then we can like, you know, fence with the West Coast, like true school and like East Coast, West Coast, strays are rap battle. And I love it. <laughs> I, I had spoken with Tim um, before the book was published about and you drop this on the fencing world and it will be like an atomic bomb. It will be disruptive. Um, and part of that's because I think it's it's a really approachable system. So a lot of people are used to something close to modern fencing or Italian fencing or French fencing. And I think this is a, a really natural jump from that world into an Iberian tradition. Uh, really disruptive technology when they're dropping into the fencing world. And I'm, I'm really glad that, that book took a long journey to get to its audience. I'm really glad that it arrived and that it's appreciated. Um, and like a lot of people, Montante is their gateway drug because people love Montante and like they just think, oh, Godinho's Montante. That's the first thing they look at. And I can usually persuade them. It's like, look at the other stuff. It's even better. <laughs> so that's usually the way I get people in is like, you know, talking to the Montanteros who just only care about the Montante. It's like, yeah, but you ever, you ever want to like, punching thrust, stab a man through the chain mail in the chest? Like, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ryan, for speaking with us tonight. I, I really enjoyed your lecture, and it's nice to get away from some of the true school stuff and uh, get into the common school a little more uh, old style. Um, so really appreciate you taking the time, lending us your expertise and your energy and your talent. Um, well, th really thank great. you. It's, it's really nice to hear about the common school from someone other than Pacheco. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's... I'm going to get one more drink in there. This, this, mean, this means a lot. Um, there's always that point, like, you know, I'm still relatively young in the HEMA community. I've only been doing this a few years. So you always look at the people who've been doing this for years and years and years. And, like, the grand old men of the Southeast, like Keith Carter Riley, and it's like, oh, I'll never be like those guys. Um, so it's it means a lot to be able to finally, like, you know, talk and, like, things like that. You're, it's it's a weird position to be in as somebody who's still, like, learning and getting his feet. But I'm, I really hope to continue to be a good exponent of the system and, like, you know, continue to grow my interpretations with like the help of everyone. Um, and I just want to let people know, feel free to reach out to me at any time. If you have like interpretations or if you have like, you know, you just want to like fence me at an event. I fenced some of you. I fenced Andre at Small Sword Symposium. I fenced Puck. Like I would have, I would have fenced all of you. So um, thank you there's, for having me. There's also a really good Facebook community uh, specifically for this tradition. Um, if somebody could post the link, and uh, I'll try to remember to post a link to that uh, group uh, when I share the video later. All right, so uh, next week we're going to have Andre Hajar speaking uh, for us, and he's going to be talking about uh, Destreza across different times. I think. Um, We'll see. I, I, I have the notes. I have not yet put together the promo material. Um, but thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. And I want you to stay safe. And we will see you again next week. Debrea is vulgar, too. Dang it. <laughs> He's talking about Debrea. <laughs> <laughs> All that French and Italian defending with a hat and dagger. That's so vulgar. <laughs> All right. Thank you again for like having me. Uh, I'll be glad to like if you ever want me to like talk again on anything the common school like i'll be glad to be out and thank you again so much for the opportunity thank you thank you everyone night everybody <laughs>